Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. Before we get started with the episode, I want to tell you about a new ebook available on our website called Buyer Beware. Why do they keep trying to sell you that annuity? This ebook covers the various types of annuities, negatives to owning annuities, and better investment alternatives to annuities. To download this ebook, you can click the link in the episode notes or go to wiserinvestor.com and you'll find it at the bottom of the page. Now on to today's episode. We're going to start off today uh, with a marketing update with our favorite around town realtor, Tom Townsend. Well, thank you very much for that. (laughs) Hey, Tom, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Good. So uh, I like to do this every now and then just to get a pulse of what's happening um, in real estate in our area. Sure. So tell me some good news. The great news is we're in a phenomenal area nationally. We still have a growing population. Our employment base is good. People are making a little bit more money than they were probably a year ago. So our incomes are coming up. So um, for a local area, if we're talking about the Atlanta metro area, we're in a great, a wonderful city. So from that standpoint, those those are your high points. So what are you what are you seeing market wise? We, we're looking at mortgage rates now. I think I saw national average for a maybe not so good credit rating was like seven point three percent. Higher credit ratings like six point eight, six point nine percent thirty year. That's crazy compared to where we've been for the last decade or more. Yeah, when uh, you compare, do, you, do you see that hurting markets or or? Yeah, I mean it does. Uh, so yeah. what's the volume like now? Well, the volume we're off about thirty percent volume wise. And we, we talk about transactions in our yep. world. So we're about 30% down from where we were last year. Now, if you take the last two years, they were outliers. Okay. So a lot of, a lot of us um, kind of take the last two years and say, just forget about it. Let's go back to 2019 and kind of compare where we were at right. at 2019. So, you know, 20 and 21 and even 22 were just crazy, weird years. Yeah. So statistically, we like to kind of throw those out. However, we're still off about 30%. So uh, where, where are we versus 19? Uh, we're, we're up. We're up. I, I can't tell you exactly okay. what the percentage is. But so we're, we're selling more than we were in 2019, even with a 30% drop over yeah. year over year. Yeah. Yeah. So what, do you, what are you seeing with home values? Home values are holding steady. So although the volume has gone down or the, 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 we have a supply issue. So yep. both the supply and the demand curve, if you want to look at it from that standpoint, have both shifted down almost equally. So we have less people looking and we have less people selling. We have less supply <laughs> and less demand. So, so that's what's enabled the home values to stay the same and not collapse like Correct. everyone predicted it could yeah. Yeah, with, with they could increase rate. Yeah, if the supply would have kept up, yeah. and the demand dropped, then you you would have seen a lot of pressure on on pricing. I mean, I like looking at real estate online. Um, I'd say that that there's there's not a whole lot of quality out there right now. Um, well, the if co- you if you want to move to something that is has a little bit of a wow factor or a nice factor to it, what one point five probably one point five million somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, where in the past, I re, well, before COVID, I remember thinking that number was uh, six to 800,000, right? <laughs> so, no, that's, that's right. So yeah. it, it's, and of course, that's all, that's all personal preference, but it's, um, I don't know, it, it's, it's kind of a weird real market. What I see as a planner, what I see is when people come in and we re- update their net worth statements, mm-hmm. you, Zillow or Redfin, they seem to be more confused than in the past. Because there's not enough movement in certain neighborhoods. They're guess, they're guesses. So please understand that those sites are taking a very large swath of data. Yeah. And they're just analyzing it. Right. <laughs> right now, because of what I mentioned earlier about the outlier and all the data that was just didn't make any sense. That's all baked into their estimates. So they truly are total guesses. They, yeah. The, so please don't go to Zillow and those kind of sites and think that that's that's a, that's accurate. the hard that's yeah. the hard number. Yeah. You may get lucky and it may be right on. However, the probability of it not really being accurate is higher now than it ever has been. And I'm sensing that as well. Um, so I'm a buyer. If you're a buyer right now, what suggestions do you have for a buyer? Well, if you're using leverage to buy a house, in other words, you're getting a mortgage. Um, go get a mortgage. Go go get pre-approved right okay. away. Um, 
that's going to be one of the first steps. Uh, actually, the first step is, is go find yourself a really good agent or realtor yeah. to help you through this whole process. Do you know one? <laughs> I do. I know a lot of them, actually. <laughs> but that's the number one thing. Get an expert. Get a professional to help you through this whole transaction. It's very easy to find a house nowadays online. Yep. You know, we all get that. But getting you successfully to the closing table is really tricky. And you mentioned earlier, all the good stuff is not online. Well, guess what happened to it? It's selling before it's hitting the market. Yeah, I was about to say, there's a lot of properties that know they've changed hands that have not. Yeah. Um, I thought, don't they all have to hit MLS, though? They do not. Okay. No. No, if, I, if I'm an agent and I am helping a client sell their home, yeah. I may already have a buyer for you. And there's no MLS. There's no MLS. Interesting. So I'm just going to say, hey, I know... You know, yeah, I know yeah. this buyer and let's go ahead and get you guys together and see if we can work out a deal. It never gets to MLS. So if you got a really nice house, yeah, that's just absolutely gorgeous that people are going to be attracted to, that's what's happening. Those are off market. Everybody's probably heard of off market. Which is why properties. it's good to have a realtor who's networking on your behalf. That's to see what I'm what's saying. Available. That's your first step. The get second step is pre approval, which ought to be pretty straightforward these days. Should be. Also understand that you can, with a good agent, you can negotiate um, a better rate than what is publicized. So we're now seeing a lot of sellers buying down a buyer's rate. Okay. So we talked about rates right now. They're high. They're 6.5 to 7, depending on where you're at. However, part of the negotiating can be, hey, can you help my buyers buy their rate down? In other words, they're going to, they're going to, Take money to closing. Yep. Take money to closing and they're going to get them down to a more reasonable rate, maybe four and a half percent over the life of the loan. They're buying points. They're buying points. At closing table. They are. And that can be part of the negotiating with buying a home. Interesting. So I'm a seller in this market. What are you suggesting? Um, Right now you need marketing behind you. The last three years, all we really needed to do is put a sign in the front yard, get it on MLS and pick, it was done. take some, you know, four or five really nice shots and you're good. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. And Hey, what, what, what do you want to sell it for? What's your price? Yeah. Okay. Let's go ahead and give it a shot. Right. Or <laughs> add 20% was, to that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's see what we can do. And we're going to be managing five or six really good offers. I mean, yeah. that was the strategy. You need marketing now. It's really marketing your property, not just listing it. So we're getting back to what real estate really should be and what it has been. It's just been vacant for the last five or six years in our area. Right. So if you're a seller, find a realtor that has really good a really good track record and find out how they're marketing their properties. Right. That could be staging. That could be helping mm-hmm. you, um, you know, declutter and modify it or paint, carpet, get it ready, get it beautified. Yeah. Uh, so we're getting back to the basics of how you actually market a property and get it ready to sell. Do you and, still have to have a property that's clean and ready to go or, or properties with little hair on them uh, still selling? Well, anything will sell for the right price. Got it. So if you have a property that needs a little bit of work or dinged up or has a little bit of hair on it, yeah. you have to take that in consideration with your pricing strategy. So if you're looking for top dollar, if you're trying to get as much as you possibly can out of a home, it has to look really, really nice. And it also depends on the price point. But You know, think about like kitchen remodeling or anything to do with remodeling in the word is more expensive than ever now. Yes. Are you still seeing people get that back out of their home or is it just really situational dependent? It's it's really situational. It depends on what price point we're talking about, yeah. the neighborhood you're talking about. Um, and how you're actually getting those, that work done. So yeah. it really depends. So an $80,000 kitchen doesn't mean you're going to sell your house for 80 or more thousand than you did before necessarily. It could so be an over improvement in some neighborhoods that may be a drastic over improvement. Yeah. So you're not going to get it back. So once right. again, having local, local knowledge, neighborhood knowledge, price point knowledge is really important before you spend those dollars on a property. Interesting. Uh, any other words of advice for us? The market is active. It's moving in Cherokee and in Cobb County on a weekly basis. We're seeing about 320 to 350 new houses enter the market. We're also seeing those turn right around and go pending or under contract almost immediately. Yeah. So um, I hear a lot of, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's so much misinformation. What's your top top three uh, recently, the rates. Yeah, uh, people are. I don't know if a lot of people have heard or not, but 
Fanny and Freddie, who is basically the right. lenders of our world, came out and they readjusted some of their fees that they charge. Well, the media took that and they totally twisted it around. Oh, and you're, said, you're talking about uh, uh, paying for underqualified people mortgages. Yes. yes. So, so what's the truth behind that? Well, the truth is those, those indexes have always been there. They've okay. always been there. And that's their fees that they charge depending on your credit rating and your, right. uh, you know, your uh, so, debt so, to income So ratios. to catch the listeners up, uh, uh, news, news outlets got to this pretty quick. But basically, to help other people afford homes, people with higher credit scores, we have to pay as much as $40 extra per month is what the cost could be in your, in your mortgage to help fund other people's mortgages who are lesser qualified. Yeah, that's kind that, of that, 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 that's, that's was in the news. So, so what was, how is that analogy incorrect? Well, all they did was they just adjusted the indexes slightly. Um, and you got to remember Fannie and Freddie were originally designed to help folks that were first time home buyers or needed right. a little push, needed a correct. little help. So that's what their original design was. So they just changed their index slightly to lower the fees down. If your credit score is a little bit lower Yep. And raise it a little bit if you had a better score. So it's, right. but the media obviously took that and said, oh, if you've got a great score, you're getting, you're basically supplementing now. <laughs> and that's not, that that's not what's happening. They just adjusted the indexes slightly. Okay. Um, so that, and, that's, yeah. And if you have a jumbo loan, mm-hmm. you didn't, it wouldn't affect you anyway. Uh, that's all private money, right? Yeah. 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 That's yeah. all private money. Wouldn't go through Fannie or Freddie or correct. traditional. Yeah. So, if you're over their threshold. Yeah. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. These are only. Freddie and Fanny underwritten loans. Under loans, yeah. yeah. Okay. What are yeah. the other two? Um, the other two are just understand that the market is still active. I mean, there's still a large buyer pool out there. Some people are, are thinking, oh, there's nothing out there. The, how, the market's frozen. And or it's their not. home is decreasing in value. That, and that was going to say number three. Number three. <laughs> number three is, oh my gosh, the crash is coming. Yeah. Uh, all the experts, and we rely on the experts, the experts, and based off of the ec- economic indicators that we look at and all the other matrixes, we do not see a crash coming anytime soon. We have a robust, we have a, a good, solid economy here. Uh, people are moving into the area. We do have a housing um, shortage. shortage. Yeah, we do. And uh, an affordability issue. Yeah. And that's why you're going to see more and more apartments starting to pop up because we, yeah. we need housing for people right. that can't afford um, the entry level into a single family. Which is a half million now. <clears throat> yeah, it really is. Our average crazy? our average price uh, in the North Georgia area is like 435 now, 435,000. Yeah. I mean, two years ago or three years ago, it was like 265. Yeah, they're, That's a they're, huge they're building, a, a, we're, we're located here, you know, on Lamaria Square, and there's a Hilton down the street with a golf course behind it. And mm-hmm. to the left was uh, substandard housing. We'll just say that. <laughs> Uh, government tore it all down and they hired a developer and they, they put in basically townhomes or yeah. houses that are just really close to each other. Yeah. And um, I noticed that uh, when I was over there recently that the starting price on those was a half million. Mm-hmm. The outside looks just like they did in the nineties when they t- cost 150,000. Yes. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> I mean, the inside obviously updated and everything, but I was, I was just shocked. It's like, man, that's crazy. The, you know, that you would live there and then you'd have to pay a half million dollars to be there. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. So we're going to see more apartment complexes pop up and townhouses, townhouses attached yeah. dwellings just right. because of the affordability issue we have. Yeah. We're going to see more of it. All right, Tom, how do we find you if we need you? Uh, you can reach me at uh, our website, which is uh, townrg.com, T O W N R G.com. Um, or you can find me on Instagram, Facebook under your townsrealtor.com and that's about it Those all right a couple of tom's companies. tom's famous if you see him around town make sure you give him a high five yeah there we go i appreciate bump. you having me back i love it <laughs> anytime you want me I'll, all right I'm, i appreciate it thanks tom see you next time all right thank you welcome to a wiser retirement podcast where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict free i'm your host casey smith guiding you to financial freedom today is my co-host missy beach hey missy hey casey so let's talk about what do we do with that old 401k? Uh, it seems like it's such a simple topic, but yet when I <laughs> kind of dove into this for today, I was like, huh, there's actually more here than maybe most people realize. 
Yes. And there's more old 401ks out there than most people realize (laughs) once they start to come in and sit down and kind of go through the list of, oh yeah, I have one at that company and that company and that company. And you realize like, oh, why haven't I done something with these plans? I'm OCD on order. Oh yeah, me and too. So it bothers me to have just rogue accounts laying out here and there. To me, they should all be in a home and have a you know purpose. But okay, um, a lot of people are busy working, so it's understandable. And with so many job changes happening right now, what do you do with that old four hundred one k? Okay, well that's a great question, and that's the question so many clients have because they feel like, oh well, I left, so. I'm not there at that employer, so I don't do anything with it anymore. So that is one option. You can leave it where it is with that old employer and stay invested in the funds that that plan offers, albeit it's going to be a limited menu of funds in most cases. They're not going to offer you the universe of investments. So um, that's kind of a drawback. And another thing to look at is if you leave it there, oftentimes they might start charging you an administrative fee each month because you're no longer an active participant in the plan. You're just kind of a legacy uh, player in that plan. So, um, you know, if you're happy with that plan, sure, leave it there, but Probably not your best option. Probably not. I mean, there's, I I look at it from an administrative standpoint. If you need to rebalance your investments for some reason, that's just another account you have to log into. Yeah. Um, There are some reasons to give pause. If you have a 401k loan for some reason, you might want to reach out to the 401k provider as you're leaving the company to see if there's a way to leave the plan there and you pay the loan back to them directly monthly. Some plan docs may allow for that. Many do not. Um, It will convert into a taxable income for you uh, in most cases. Uh, Yeah, that's really tricky. If you have a 401k loan, you need to think about that (laughs) before you resign or think of leaving. Because like you were saying- Depending on the size of it, yes. Yeah, it depends. And that's a big consideration. So if your plan docs allow you to leave that loan in place, yeah, then you're definitely not going to move that 401k anywhere because that's going to be your best option. What if you have employer stock in your 401k? Okay, that's another interesting thing. And it depends, you know, like so many things in financial planning, it depends. There's this really cool thing called net unrealized depreciation, which comes into play with the employer stock portion of your 401k. So if you're in one of those plans and you've built up a huge allocation to your employer stock, and over the years, um, it's become a large percentage of your overall balance, and that employer stock has a really low basis. What you can do um, when you leave your employer is roll out um, the rest of the assets to an IRA, but then the company stock portion, you would roll out to a taxable brokerage account. Yes, you're going to pay income tax on the employer stock portion, but only the basis of that. So Mm -hmm. say your position in employer stocks worth $500,000, but the basis is only $50,000, you're only going to pay ordinary income tax on that $50,000, and then it's sitting in your taxable brokerage account. So you want to let it season in there for over a year, so then when you sell it, you're just paying long-term capital gains on that 450000 Which is 15 to 20% yes. versus um, having to pay maybe even higher from, from income tax. Yes. So don't just arbitrarily roll over, you know, the whole 401k to an IRA if you've got a lot of company stock in there. You need to analyze that. Absolutely. So... Um, keeping it there may, that may be a very good reason. Also, mm-hmm. you could be have super low fees. 
Yeah. So maybe it's cheaper there than it is rolling it out into paying retail price for other funds. Yeah, a good example of that, Casey, is the government TSP, Thrift Savings Plan. Yep. Um, when clients come to us and they've got legacy thrift savings plans, that's a case where it doesn't make sense to roll it into an IRA because those fees are so darn low, like just a few basis points that, you know, hey, we have to look out for their best interests. And even with our low cost investments, it's really hard to beat the government's thrift savings plan. Very true. So if you don't have maybe an ultra low cost 401k, um, you're concerned about just, you know, add administrative issues. You just, it's easier to manage money if it's in one place. You don't have employer stock and you don't have a employer loan, then I'd say roll it out. Um, the first place you should probably look at rolling it to is your new 401k plan. So you got a new job, you're eligible for a new 401k plan. Why not roll it there? Exactly. Just account consolidation is always the way to go. Clean it up, streamline it, make it easy. Um, and that's, you know, you need to consider your new 408 401k plan and make sure that you have good investment options in it. And it's not a plan that's, you know, with a rogue custodian or plan administrator that has high investment fees. Right. If your 401k plan starts with American funds. (laughs) (laughs) Don't go there. Don't go there. (laughs) Or, you know, other companies that, uh, that are, that are old legacy players in the, in the space. Yeah. Um, so yeah, typically that, that's our first recommendation is that you just take it to your new 401k plan after we've done some analysis on, um, the cost of that plan. Now you also can roll it into an IRA and you could roll it into an IRA for self-management. So you could open up an account at Schwab or a Fidelity mm-hmm. and you would roll it there and you would choose your own investments. I don't know that that's always the best choice for people, but, um, that, that is an option that you could that you could do that. Um, there are also professional management of IRAs. That's what we do. We manage money here. Um, but there's also automated uh, IRAs now, automated investment IRAs like Betterment yes. is an example. Mm-hmm. Um, Schwab has the, uh, is it the intelligent portfolios, uh, which is a Betterment type thing where you basically you're choosing a risk tolerance, you put your money in and they're choosing uh, the low cost index funds to be invested in. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that that's a low cost way of, of having professional management. Um, then you could also um, cash it out. Uh, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> so, well, I mean, if it's a thousand dollars or it's $500, yeah, know. you know, just, just maybe it's better just to cash it out. I don't know. Yeah, you know, you get to that point where it's the law of diminishing returns. Is it worth the headache of going through an account application and transfer of account paperwork and then reinvesting your $800 in an IRA, which may not be the best thing for a young person to have an IRA balance. Yeah. Because having an IRA balance kind of takes you out of the game for some other techniques that we like to do with clients. Yeah. Think about this. If you roll your IRA to your, I mean, your old 401k to your new 401k and you don't have an IRA, then you could do a backdoor Roth. Yes. And so doing a backdoor Roth is a great strategy if you're over the income limit to contribute to a regular Roth IRA. So no matter how much you earn, you're still able to contribute annually to a Roth IRA with the backdoor strategy. But the key to that is that you have to have a zero balance in a traditional IRA to be that conduit account to get it into the Roth IRA um, and not be a taxable event. Correct. Um, This is where you just have to be careful with our industry because our industry for the most part gets paid to manage assets. Yeah. And for the most part, our industry manages assets and does very light financial planning. Uh, I don't know that I've ever met a a firm that wasn't independent like we are and fee only and fiduciary (laughs) that, that also did financial planning at the, at, at the same level that we do it. And we do offer financial planning 
uh, under an hourly basis or a flat fee basis just for this reason so we can make recommendations that are conflict free and there are oper- there are situations where you'd want professional management for IRAs and not roll it over there are situations like that and some people cuz some people just want easy they do want easy but um that's when you know we still have to tell them that we have to make recommendations in their best interest and you know, keeping their TSP plans open, their government <laughs> right. savings plans, even though that might be a little bit more difficult because they have to, you know, reallocate on their own right? versus having them roll it into an IRA with us that we manage for them. Um, and we would make money off of that balance But, you know, I was just telling a client couple the other day, like, no, it makes sense for you to keep the TSPs where they are and not not turn them over to us to manage. So, yeah, I know it requires an extra step, but we can help you (laughs) allocate those TSP plans and not pay us to manage them. Correct. So let's shift gears a little bit, Missy. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here for a second. So Uh you were a guest speaker at the Invest in Women conference here in Atlanta, representing Wiser Wealth Mm -hmm. Management. What are some of your big takeaways from your two or three days uh, that you spent down there? Ah, well, that's a good question. Um, So the panel that I spoke on was talking about transitioning clients through tough times in the market. And, you know, what we did to help our clients make it through. And so one of our big takeaways, um, something that I did a lot with my clients was a lot with education planning. And so how clients that might not have planned for primary and secondary education um, at private schools were suddenly faced with the decision, do we continue this remote learning or do we dive back into it uh, and look at private school that was not in the long-term plan? So um, we did a lot of education planning that was not in the long-term plan and found a way to make that work with giving and taking, some stay-at-home moms going back to work, and that sort of thing. So it was a unique way to kind of redeploy assets and cash flows, Um, but there was just a lot of ideas shared amongst, um, the women at the conference about ways that, you know, sitting on our side of the table and not necessarily being an investment only firm, um, it's just a better way to service clients being focused on really knowing our client families, I think, And that's what really came across as um, the way that we retained our clients through, you know, all these remote meetings and not being face to face is that we knew who, you know, needed that phone call or needed that email or we could anticipate questions about who we needed to check in on or, you know, Maybe some of our widowed clients who were at home by themselves needed, you know, an extra little amount of love. But um, that was kind of the consensus, I think, that most female advisors felt was that those of us that had that personalized relationship and it wasn't just, you know, like client number 291 in our book of business yep. were the ones that found success through that period. Yeah. I, I, over the years, I mean, obviously our firm here is much, much larger than it used to be, but I still am around town and, and something will happen. And I'll think about someone and go, Oh man, they would really like that. Yeah. And, and the same thing happens. Like I remember when, um, uh, uh, it was at Bucky's, uh, the was huge gas stations, <laughs> but so, someone, someone sent me a text and said, Hey, next time you go see your sister, the Bucky's on 16, you need to stop there. This place is crazy. And I think, man, that's, that's, I showed it to one of our advisors at the time. I said, look, this is the kind of relationship you have to have with, with people. It's not just about 
money invested and even not just about a plan, but it's understanding what's happening in their lives and being able to celebrate things, you know, along with them. So, um, that's great. That's great that you are out there and, 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 in that uh, environment with other women in our industry. Oh yeah. It was so fun to network and be out of the office, just <laughs> kind of like in my element with, you know, other women and other um, women supporters is what are, I forget what they call our male advocates. Male advocates. That's the, the name th- for the men who didn't know is a women's only yeah, conference. The three men that were there. <laughs> right. That's hilarious. So, All right. Well, thanks for your time today and I look forward to our next chat. All right. Thanks, Casey. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We'd also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. This episode was produced and edited by Ken Hoadley. This podcast is strictly for informational purposes only and is not to be considered as investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any financial products, securities, digital assets, or any other investment vehicles or a basis to make any financial decisions. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor with the SEC. The host and or guest may personally own securities, digital assets, or other investment vehicles mentioned on this podcast. Neither the host nor guest of the show are compensated for their participation and no referral fees are paid to or received by any host or guest for clients, listeners, or similar interests. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor, tax professional, insurance professional, and or legal professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.